Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Well, hello there. This is Dee and welcome to episode 19 of the Benzo Free Podcast. I hit another wave again. (laughs) You know, some paresthesia on my face. You know, my my good old trusty spiders that have come to love (laughs) as they crawl around. Some tinnitus and cog fog or or brain fog is pretty prevalent right now. And, you know, this morning I almost put a bowl of grits in the microwave with a spoon in it. (laughs) I had to ask my wife to hold the conversation to hold talking to me until I finished making my breakfast. You know, the complicated things like instant grits in the microwave. I couldn't do both. Multitasking is one of the key things that I lose. It it goes when I get the cog fog. Um, I also have been unable to pull names, um, people's names and words lately. I'm not too worried. Honestly, I've had it before. I'm sure I'll have it again. And I, I know we'll pass in a week or two. It's not something of concern. It's more of a reminder. But just so you know, in case today's podcast is a bit confusing (laughs) or I ramble on too much, please, please forgive me. I apologize. And as for our format today, we will include our introduction, Benzo News, Benzo Story, and our feature. We'll skip our mailbag and spotlight this week. No worries. They'll be back soon. Our feature today is Relationships, Intimacy, and Sex in Benzo Withdrawal. This subject came directly from you, the listeners. I've had a few requests for this topic, and since you asked, here it is. I do want to mention here in the introduction that I need some stories, okay? For a while I had a backlog of a month or so, but now I have like one, maybe two in the queue at a time. So I'm running really low, and if we want to keep the stories as part of our format, then I need new ones to come in so I can share them. Please, if you've been thinking about submitting your Benzo story so we can share it on the podcast, no better time than the present. But if you're not ready or don't feel like it, absolutely no pressure. And the same goes for comments and questions. Please, whatever you have, send it in. Send it to benzofree.org slash feedback or email us at podcast at benzofree.org. And don't forget to sign up for our mailing list at benzofree.org slash subscribe. And please remember that the Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. And if you happen to be listening to this podcast on one of our providers, please leave feedback on that carrier. This does help new listeners find us. Let's move on. And that brings us to Benzo News. Here are the highlights from last week, the week of May 12th, 2019. On Sunday, I posted a quick note wishing all the mothers out there a happy Mother's Day. And that's for you too, Mom. Also on Sunday, InterestingEngineering.com shared a story titled, True and False Myths About Flights. Since fear of flying is common among many of us, I thought it might help quell a few fears. On Monday, Psychology Today posted an article titled, A Holistic Approach to Naturally Lowering Anxiety. This was a good reminder of some valuable tools we all need. On Wednesday, we released Episode 18 of the Benzo Free Podcast, titled The Science of Benzos, GABA and Glutamate. It took a look at the two key neurotransmitters in the body and how they are affected by benzodiazepines. Also on Wednesday, Psychology Today posted another article titled Anxiety is on the Rise. What can you do to ward it off? This article voiced concern about our love affair with avoidance and encouraged us to find, well, a better way. On Thursday, I wrote an article titled, Lavender Oil and Anxiety, the Facts Behind Some Recent Claims. It was a look at the various debate on this topic, and I provided some 
facts, and recent studies. And on Saturday, NBC News posted an article titled, What Your Therapist Wants You to Know About CBT. It provided a detailed introduction to cognitive behavioral therapy and shared its benefits. And that wraps up our news. You can see all these posts on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash benzofree. And please, if you know of any other great articles or news that you would like us to cover, tell us. And from anywhere around the world, we're always looking for news on benzos, dependence, and recovery. And that's it for our news. Let's move on to our benzo story. Today I have a story from Linda in Christchurch, New Zealand. Linda writes, Hi, D. I am writing from the city known for earthquakes and terrorism, Christchurch, New Zealand. I would never have believed that these terrible events could happen in this small and innocent city when I moved back home in 2007 after living in the UK for 14 years. We have so many loving people in New Zealand. Look at the nationwide response to the terrorist attack of March 15th. It makes me proud to be a New Zealander. My memory is so impaired after years on Ativan that I can't remember when I started it or when I increased it from one pill to two to three and then, worst of all, taking four, and mixing them with alcohol in a terrible binge this January. I lost a job in December because I couldn't remember anything. I was severely cognitively impaired and this made me dreadfully depressed. I now know this was from Ativan. Just recently, I found your podcast, and it means so much to me. The podcast, the information, the letters, and the community of us listening, I am no longer alone. You feel like a loving brother to me, and I listen and re-listen when I wake up to cope better with my day. I am sounding very dramatic and wish I could joke about it, as is my way to cover up my sadness. I will briefly tell you my experience, strength, and hope. I was always a highly sensitive person who bounced from highs to lows and I was diagnosed as having bipolar disorder in 2008 after a week in a hospital when I had clinical depression. In the UK I had functioned well managing my difficulties by isolating myself. I didn't want anyone to know how I really was and I managed to mask really well outside of my flat so no one knew how anxious and depressed I really was. Back in New Zealand, I was unable to hide my depression. I came back because I couldn't function in the UK anymore. I went to a doctor here and started mood disorder drugs, an antipsychotic, Prozac, Z drugs, and later on, here's where I can't remember, Ativan, one pill a day. It was, it was probably around 2011 after the deadly quake, and I can't remember if I got it because my anxiety got worse. We, we had four huge quakes, one deadly, but all in all they happened constantly. And there were over 10,000, yes, 10,000 over two years, from 2.5 to 7.1. Anyway, I loved Ativan, and I was hooked. I was allowed to increase my dose to two pills a day, but usually I took three and called in my prescription early. You could have it again after three weeks. My guess is that because I made a suicide attempt... My doctor let me stay on Ativan, thinking if I didn't take it, I might overdose again. Oh dear, D, this isn't cheery at all. I, I will come to my strengths and hopes shortly. <laughs> I, I am a person with a lot of dark humor, and boy, that helps. So, I have taken Ativan for six or seven years without being told to stop. I didn't want to stop and I didn't educate myself. I, I didn't care if I only felt better for a few hours. It was still a few hours. I have only educated myself listening to your podcast and reading the Ashton Manual plus your articles. Okay, time for strength. I stopped Z drugs last year, alcohol this February, and I switched to diazepam from Ativan in February. It has made it so much easier to taper doing this. I had tried with Ativan several times, but I couldn't cope with the withdrawal symptoms and being back to my depression and anxiety. Diazepam doesn't give me much relief, not like Ativan, but it is much easier coming off this longer-lasting benzo. If I stick to my schedule, 
which I asked my doctor for after reaching the rock bottom in January which I spoke about earlier. Then it will be done next month. Been so free. I have isolated myself. My hypersensitivity makes me so easily triggered, and giving up both benzos and alcohol is so hard. I know I shouldn't isolate, but being home alone is comforting. I volunteer once a week. By the way, the interview with your wife, Shanna, made me cry. It was so beautiful, and what Shanna said, that a soup kitchen might be too much when you're in withdrawal, so look and see what's needed close to home, if that's easier for you. That was such good advice. Thank you so much, Dee, and thank you and hi to everyone who listens. And for these wonderful, honest letters. My strength is my determination to be off diazepam next month. And my hope is to start my life anew, because at the moment, my life is nil. And I am almost totally isolated apart from my cat. Like your dog, Bear, my cat, Daisy, is a godsend. A loving, fun tortie who was found as a kitten wandering the city streets. I think we are a godsend to each other. By the way, I love the meditation minute at the end. And would love if you could maybe read children's classics to us to help us sleep. W what a soothing voice. Warmest regards to you, Shanna and Bear, and best wishes to all of you listening. We can do it. Linda. Well, thank you, Linda. Wow. <laughs> so, so much to absorb there. And, and thanks so much for the kind words. It, it means the world. I'm so glad that our podcast has helped you. My emotions well up inside of me every time I hear someone say things like that. And trust me, sharing your story today has helped others. I am so glad you did that. It means so much. You, you write my script for me every time. When somebody sends me a letter about their Benzo experience, you've written this script for me. All I'm doing is reading it. I'm just the messenger. You're the one who has the courage to share your story. Thank you, Linda. What a wonderful story. And I, I can't wait to hear more from you and, and how you're doing once you're benzo free. Please let us know any updates on your progress. And you know, that goes for every single one of you. Even if you haven't shared your story, but if you have shared your story with us on the podcast, give us an update. I would love to share some progress reports as part of our benzo story section. People want to know. I want to know. <laughs> we want to know how you're doing. Even if things have turned dark for a while, let us know. Share that. But especially if things are getting better and you're finding success, we really need those. I've gotten a lot of requests for success stories lately, for, for sharing them, and I can only share them if I receive them. But it doesn't matter whether it's success or trials or tribulations or whatever. They help us be connected, and I'm really grateful for them. Thanks. So... Send in your stories, send in your progress, anything, you know, short ones, long ones, blue ones, green ones, and, and purple ones too. Even if it's just a paragraph or two, we'd love to share it. Go to our website at bensofree.org slash feedback or email us at podcast at bensofree.org and tell us your story. Thanks. And that brings us to our feature. Today's feature is Relationships, Intimacy, and Sex in Benzo Withdrawal. This is an interesting one to tackle. Honestly, when this topic was suggested to me, the topic of intimacy, it, it sounded like a great idea. But once I decided to tackle it, I didn't really know where to start. Are, are we talking sexual intimacy, asexual intimacy, a little of both, or something completely different like self-love, compassion, and emotional connection? Or even relationships as a whole, and how to help them survive the trials of benzo withdrawal? While I do talk some about relationships and love in my book, I don't really have much on intimacy. And you know, the more I think about this topic, the more I see my oversight in not including it. So, without literary structure to get me started, I decided to create this one from scratch. But I did have a place I could start. I could start with you, the listeners. Let's hear from Anne from Canton, Michigan, who wrote a comment to me earlier this month which encouraged this topic. Anne said, a suggestion for a future episode would be that of the effects of BZD withdrawal on relationship intimacy. 
This doesn't mean just intimacy of the sexual nature, although with the scrambled dopamine serotonin there is that issue. But things like how ultra-sensitivity to sound, light, and even agoraphobia can negatively impact some of the dynamics of an otherwise loving relationship. So, by the grace of the benzo-free gnomes, here we are with intimacy as our feature topic. And, and yes, the benzo-free gnomes are real. Ask me, I'll introduce them to you later. Intimacy in relationships is a huge topic, even without the complications of benzo withdrawal. And, and that's going to be the core of our discussion today. But not everyone has a relationship. What about them? This is an excerpt from my ongoing correspondence with one of our listeners. I asked her if it would be okay if I shared it here, and she agreed. Thank you for that. She writes, Being single does suck, and for the life of me, I can't imagine how I will find someone. Thanks for the assurance that you think I will. I like to think someone will find me in the old-fashioned way of just a random encounter, not... No, no online dating for me. Can't do that. Faith. Need tons of faith and have precious little of it. Thirty sounds so young to me. I, I used to get tons of attention because I was a very pretty girl. Never had a shortage of male admirers. Now I can't imagine attracting anybody. Anyway, can't imagine being in a real relationship with this going on. When I am well, perhaps everything will fall into place. When, when I say well, I mean when this withdrawal is over. As well as when I have finally released the need for unhealthy relationships and, and let go of the past. I think those things will happen at the same time. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I really appreciate it. And I appreciate the courage to be willing to share that with our listeners. It was, it's intimate thoughts, it's real thoughts, and your willingness to open up like that is really appreciated. Now, before I dig in too deep, I do want to remind you that I am not a psychologist nor therapist. I don't claim to have any professional training in counseling, marriage counseling, or any other discipline which would qualify me for giving psychological advice. This is not advice. It's just my observations and a few things I learned along the way from research. Okay, now that I've said that, let's dive right in. Sex. Come on, it's fun to say, you gotta admit. And even funner to think about, and even funner to... No, I'm gonna stop right there. <laughs> this is still a PG broadcast. <laughs> One thing I am grateful for is that I have very little modesty. I mean... To me, it's just sex, after all. It's an activity in which almost every adult has participated in, and yet we blush, turn away, and get incredibly uncomfortable when the topic is raised. It's so ironic. We can watch a sexy scene in a movie by ourselves and become aroused. In fact, there's a whole industry built on this concept. But when someone else suddenly comes in the room, we rush to find the remote control and turn it to gardening or football or anything the furthest from sexual we can find. <laughs> and if it's your parents who walk into the room, <laughs> you look for the nearest gopher hole to dive into and die. And if it's your grandparents, oh, okay, I've said enough, I'm going to stop this. <laughs> Why is one of the most common activities in the human experience and one of the most essential, I mean, none of us would be here without this. Also the hardest to openly and honestly talk about. But, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. Back to the word du jour, which is intimacy. You know, the human animal is a social animal. We need human connection. Some more than others, but it is a vital component to being human for every single one of us. In fact, human babies will die without this connection. This emotional connection is critical to our survival, and yet we so often avoid it at every turn. This connection can happen in many ways, via eye contact, through face-to-face -face conversation, and through touch. Social media is both friend and foe in our attempts to satisfy this need. It can help us plan events and connect with people of similar interests, even in different parts of the globe. But it also has a tendency to take over our lives and pretend to be a substitute for intimate connections. 
filling our lives with false promises, comparisons, and untruths. It doesn't include some of the key components of intimacy. I read an article a little while back that said our biggest crisis in the world today is the lack of intimate connection and human touch. There are so many people out there who are either afraid to make this kind of connection or don't have it available to them. The one thing we are missing more, in my opinion, than anything else in our modern society is this true intimate connection. It's almost an epidemic and it's causing a cascade of problems. And unfortunately, benzodiazepines only make it worse. But what really is intimacy? You know, just for fun, let's look at the definitions for this term from the Oxford English Dictionary. First one is close familiarity or friendship. Well, that fits. Close familiarity. Not bad, but still missing something. Second one is a cozy and private or relaxed atmosphere. So that's defining the place and not the people. Well, you know, we'll skip that one for now. The third one is Sexual intercourse. Ah, now there's a fun one. But no offense, even sexual intercourse can be devoid of intimacy. Sure, it's hard not to have some level of physical intimacy during sex. I mean, it's sex. But emotional intimacy? Not always. Sometimes it's just sex. You know, let's come back to that later. The fourth one is an intimate remark. Again, not exactly relevant to our topic today, so we're going to skip that one. And fifth, and fifth, closeness of observation or knowledge of a subject. Yeah, that doesn't fit either. Okay, we're going to skip that one too. So what does that leave us with? Well, I guess we're left with close familiarity and sexual intercourse. Well, I'm feeling a bit unfulfilled. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> when I think of intimacy, there is one key word that I think is critical. And neither of these definitions got there. That word is vulnerability. In my opinion, true intimacy is not possible without vulnerability. We have to open up to each other. We have to share embarrassing, scary, bizarre thoughts with each other. We have to share our thoughts and feelings and even, more importantly, listen to the thoughts and feelings of the other. But there's one problem here. Being vulnerable is hard, damn hard, and it's scary as hell. Some of us have been hurt. No, I take that back. All of us have been hurt. It's part of the human experience. Perhaps you trusted someone once, opened up, and then was betrayed. Come on, haven't we all felt that at some time? Perhaps you have a traumatic event in your life. Most of us have. You know, job termination, exclusion, bullying, divorce, violence, abuse, you name it. We've all trusted someone at some time or another, and then that trust was destroyed. Not one person on this earth is without that baggage. And that baggage, those events, that trauma, it makes it hard to trust again. It makes it hard to be vulnerable. So what do we do? We close up. We protect ourselves. We make sure that no one will ever hurt us ever, ever, ever again. We climb into our proverbial submarine, close the hatch, dive under the Arctic Circle, and hide. And the modern-day world is not helping us. Every turn, every channel, every internet page, every billboard, every tabloid at the supermarket reminds us of one thing. To be afraid. And even more so to be afraid of other people. Don't trust them because you know they are all out to get you. So we build a wall. Once we build this wall that would put China to shame, once you protected yourself so much, once you know no one will ever hurt you again, you discover that little pill you've been taking for the past several years to help you worry less about all these people who are, you know, out to get you, is actually making things worse. And then you decide to withdraw. So now you have this wall up, which was built from years of just, well, being human. 
and you've also decided to withdraw from a drug which had been to a limited degree managing some of that fear. And on top of all that, you're about to face a slew of symptoms which will bombard you from every angle, ones that make you so sensitive to life's triggers that you reinforce that wall. You make it twice as big and block out everything and everybody and even the ones you love who are trying to help you. Welcome to the Nightmare of Intimacy and Benzo Withdrawal. I am blessed. I already had an amazing partner by my side. Many of you know her. If you don't, check out episode 12, Conversation with the Caregiver, and you'll learn more. Shannon and I have a pretty solid marriage, but it doesn't come easy. We have to work at it every day. So many of you have had strong relationships during this time, but many of them didn't survive the trial of withdrawal. And I'm really sorry about that. There's really no one to blame here. This is incredibly hard on both sides, and it's amazing how any relationship survived. And then there are some of you who didn't have anybody by your side when you started. You're doing this solo. I've talked with so many of you, and, and my heart breaks. Whether you have a solid person by your side, had one but didn't make it, or are doing this alone, the principles of intimacy during Benza withdrawal are the same. This wall we talk about protects you, to, to a degree. It does. It's not all bad. When you are so amazingly sensitive as we are in withdrawal, you have to be careful. You build that wall, or, as I said in a previous episode, I had my boxer bubble, but it only works for a while. And, and that wall, that fortress, that bubble keeps anyone else in your life out, even those close to you. And being the other person on the outside of that wall can be just as lonely as you are. During withdrawal, we sometimes have personality changes. We can almost become different people. We are often depressed, in pain, anger easily, are extremely sensitive to everything, sounds, light, food, touch. Everything and anything can set us off. We can be afraid to socialize. We can be afraid to go out and talk to people. We can be afraid to leave our house. This doesn't just place a burden on us. It places a burden on everyone who lives with us. I was limited in the social activities I could partake in. I was afraid to be in awkward social situations. I was afraid of being trapped. I was afraid sometimes of leaving the house. And this wasn't just a limitation for me. It was a limitation for my wife. My restrictions were her restrictions to a degree. And this made it hard on her. This can be really difficult and can put a strain on any relationship. But there are things you can do to help improve it. Let's face it, we are not easy people to live with, not in the least. It's not our fault, and we wish we could snap our fingers and change it, but we can't. So how can a relationship, especially an intimate relationship, survive benzo withdrawal? Well, first off, I just want to say this, it can Mine survived. Others have survived. It happens a lot. Unfortunately, some don't make it. Our symptoms can seem so intense that they rule everything in our lives. But they don't really have to. At least not all the time. When we are hypersensitive both to physical stimulation like light, sound, and touch, and to emotional triggers, we isolate ourselves. Sometimes we don't even know we are doing it, but sometimes we do. Thinking of someone other than yourself during benzo withdrawal is hard, but it can help. Not only to maintain a relationship which is important to you, but also to give your own mind a break from obsessing about your symptoms and the apparent hopeless nature of your illness. Share what is going on with you with your loved one. They are there to help you. You need them, and they need you to tell them what is going on. I believe there are four keys to a healthy, intimate relationship in withdrawal. First off, and most important, is communication. You've probably heard it a million times, but it's true. It's so easy in withdrawal to hide deep inside your own pain, but it's not healthy. People who love you want to help you, but they can't if you don't tell them. One of the things I asked of Shanna during my withdrawal was if she could read the Ashton Manual. 
the whole thing, and she did. This made me feel better. Sure, she'll never know what it's really like unless she went through it, but she knows a lot, and every little bit helped. This also validated my illness in her mind. This was documentation from a doctor of what I was going through. One of the hardest symptoms on a relationship is irritability and anger and, and the desire to isolate yourself and, and not be around people or especially not to even be touched. We, we can get mad for no reason whatsoever and just feel that we don't want to be around anybody. And far too often we take this out on the ones we love. Over time, as with most symptoms, we might recognize this as it's coming on. After dealing with this symptom for some time and being sharp and cutting with my wife at times, I told her what was going on in my head. And we talked, and we worked out a system. Now when I feel irritable or short-tempered or just plain mad, I tell her, I need space. That's it. And then she gives it to me. And you know what? She can say it too, and she has. And I give it to her. It goes both ways. The translation of this phrase for us is simple. It's basically me saying, I'm feeling angry right now. It's not something you did, and I'm not really angry at you. It's just a symptom, and I need some time to cool down. For the two of us, this really works. For you, it might be something different. The key here is to communicate and share what you're dealing with. The second key is honesty and trust. Being honest is hard, even in intimate relationships, especially in intimate relationships. But it's critical if there is to be trust. I trust my wife implicitly, and yet I still get suspicious. I still wonder what she's thinking. I even get jealous. Being honest means not only restraining from lying, but also from holding back. I was jealous a few times with my wife during withdrawal, and, and I told her. In fact, I told her and the other person, too. I told them this was not a rational feeling, and I knew that. But it's a feeling nonetheless, and I wanted them to know. I was not judgmental in any way or accusatory. I said this was my problem, but I wanted them to be aware of it. And you know what? They both listened, and they understood, and they agreed to be just a little more cautious about not triggering that feeling. And we went back to our business. Now, I realize this may not be the response every person will give you, but I'm so glad I took the chance either way. I was just glad to have that off my chest and to open up. To me, intimate relationships are all about trust. And broken trust is one of the hardest things to repair. That's the real victim of affairs. It's the broken trust, the broken bond, the faith in each other. And in Benzo withdrawal, you can avoid breaking that trust by being open, being honest, and sharing your feelings. The third key is presence. The third key is presence. Blogger J.C. Peters said the following in an article in Psych Central in 2018. Intimacy is, at its essence, a practice of presence. We've learned tactics for distraction and disassociation, exacerbated by our beeping phones and the TV in the background, not to mention our learned cultural terror of awkward silences. Listening is key. Paying attention to the other person when you're in their presence is vital to an intimate connection. J.C. continued, In order to avoid these silences and perhaps to head off the vulnerability of intimacy, we tend to insert ourselves into our conversations. When a friend tells us they've had a bad day, we jump in to relate it to our own lives or to try to fix the problem so they'll stop feeling what they are expressing. None of that is really listening. Listening requires that we shut up some of the time and simply hold space for the other person. When I was first married to Shanna, she would come home from work and vent about difficulties at work, and I would try to fix the problem. <laughs> That's what we do. 
by offering fixes and suggestions, we think we are helping the other person. The, the thing is, she didn't need me to fix these things. She just wanted me to listen. And I learned. <laughs> I'm a better listener now, but I still try to fix things now and then. I'm probably going to show my age here, but I am older now, and it's who I am. One of the things that bothers me constantly is people on their cell phones. Perhaps I just haven't adapted yet to the new millennium, but when I was young, I was taught that this kind of behavior was out-and-out out rude. Sometimes when my wife and I would go out to a restaurant, we'd look over another table and there's a couple having dinner and both are on their phones the whole night. I don't get it. I was taught that not paying attention to someone, not looking them in the eye, not responding to them when they say something, I was taught that that behavior was not acceptable. I guess that's not the case anymore, and I'm just having trouble adjusting. You know, I don't even carry my phone with me most of the time, on purpose. I don't want to be that distracted, and honestly, I don't want to be that connected to the outside world. I want to be in the presence of where I am. The world and the people in it are pretty damn interesting to me, especially now after withdrawal. And I'm starting to pay a lot more attention to that. And the fourth key, the one I opened with, is vulnerability. And this is the hardest one of them all. Vulnerability takes courage. It means opening yourself up again to being hurt, taking a chance and hoping for the best. This is hard, but the rewards can be amazing. We have all been hurt, and we will all be hurt again. But it's not all hurt. In fact, most of our life is joy. And if you block out the hurt, you block out some of the joy too. In Benza withdrawal, this means opening the door to your own chemically enhanced brand of crazy and letting somebody else see it. That's a scary thought. But with courage and kindness and compassion, we can do it. Intimacy is crucial to healthy sexual relationships. Many of us like to pretend it's not. And as I said in the intro, there are sexual encounters which have almost nothing to do with emotional intimacy. But for the most part, sex and intimacy are intertwined. And sex is good for us. That's right, having sex is healthy. Now, of course, I'm referring to loving, consensual sex between two adults. And I also completely understand that many people have trauma associated with sex. And this really complicates this issue. Please understand, I am never trying to gloss over that and pretend that is an asignificant factor. But in general, between two healthy, consenting adults, it can be a pretty awesome thing. Many studies have revealed that lack of sex in a relationship is a bellwether of difficulties ahead. Sex breeds intimacy, and intimacy can breed more sex. In fact, research shows that the rhythm of sex can allow us to lose ourselves, you know, much like a meditative state. Sex may even trigger an altered state of consciousness. In a 2016 review from Northwestern University, Adam Saffron stated that rhythmic stimulation during sex enhances neural oscillations in the brain and can create a near trance-like state. But why is it so complicated? <laughs> there are a hundred different groups with a hundred different answers to this one. Personally, I love discovering the reasons why we are the way we are, from religion to science to evolutionary psychology. It's fascinating to me. But I think that depth of a discussion is better for another place another time. For argument's sake, let's just accept the fact that sexual relationships involve intimacy and emotions, and that's the way it's always been, and we can't do a damn thing about it, not that we should. <laughs> Truly passionate, intimate sex requires, you probably know where I'm going with this one, vulnerability. Physically speaking, there is no other time two beings are closer. Well, you know, except for the obvious exception of pregnancy and childbirth. But for two adults, 
during the sex act, we are the closest physically we can be. And this closeness, this intimacy is something we all crave from the core of our beings. I mean, the pleasure of sex is pretty amazing, quite fantastic actually. But the intimacy of being connected to another living being, feeling almost like you're one linked with someone else in this cascade of love and pleasure, that is amazing. And then when it's over, you turn on late night TV. Well, maybe you cuddle a little bit in there somewhere. But here's the eternal question. If sex is so wonderful, so powerful, so beautiful, so pleasurable, then why aren't more people having it and enjoying it in a healthy fashion? Why is it so freaking complicated? And, and why is it tied to so many emotions, good and bad? A couple of weeks ago, I shared an article on Inverse.com titled, Who's Avoiding Sex? Psychiatrist Cites Three Reasons. I'll put a link to it in our show notes. In this article, the author lists the following reasons for avoiding sex. Number one, medical problems. According to research, this is the number one reason both men and women avoid sex. Whether it's heart disease, chronic pain, or depression associated with that pain, metabolic conditions like diabetes and obesity, personality disorders, addiction or substance abuse, poor sleep quality, low testosterone in men, low levels of dopamine and serotonin in men and women, and, and finally, medications, including antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs. Yes, benzos made the list. The second reason is social factors. For both genders, loneliness severely affects the availability of sex. And on top of that, with benzos, we might have agoraphobia or other social phobias, which makes any type of human connection very difficult. And loneliness also reduces a person's self-esteem, often making him or her actually less attractive. It's another one of those vicious cycles I talk about. And the third reason is emotional influences. Shame and guilt are big factors, huge factors for some people. There's also fear of attachment or other commitments that may come with the sex act. Cultural and religious factors can play a big role here. And in my opinion, there's another factor that keeps us from having a healthy sex life. And that is fear. You might have saw that one coming if you've been listening to this podcast for a while. On one side in life, you have these amazing things like intimacy, passion, connection, compassion, and, and beauty of all types. And they all stem from one core emotion, love. And on the other side, you have betrayal, guilt, hate, shame, anger, disgust. And they all stem from one core emotion, fear. In my opinion, it all boils down to that. When we are unable to be vulnerable, it is fear. Fear that he won't find me sexy, or fear that she will leave me, or fear that he's thinking of someone else, or fear that she's faking it, or, or fear that I'm going to mess this up and do something wrong and wind up all alone again. That's the fear talking. But there's a problem with living your life by fear. It always ends up badly. Living your life from fear rather than from love is a recipe for disaster. So the first thing you have to decide, even in the middle of benzo withdrawal, is how you want to live your life. In fear, anger, hate, and shame, or in love, passion, compassion, and intimacy. Now, of course, this is not going to be some quick fix. There are no quick fixes, especially when it comes to mental health. Psychological patterns can take months, even years to change. But you know what? Learning where the problem is is an amazing first step. Once you've made a decision, and I hope you chose love and intimacy, you did do that, right? <laughs> okay, good. Once you've made that decision, it's time to tell your partner. That's right. Tell your partner what you're thinking. Tell him your dreams. Tell her your fears. Yes, all of them. Well, well, maybe not all at once. <laughs> it's okay to start small. But start. Take a small step in that direction. Open up and let the other person inside. You just might be surprised. 
Communication is the key. Study after study on relationships still come back to one thing above all others, communication. You have to talk with each other. You have to let the other person in. True intimacy with another person is amazing. I have it with two people in my life, my wife and best friend, and my buddy, my other best friend. I think that's fantastic. I have two people in my life from whom I am completely vulnerable with. Unfortunately, that's two more than most people. Which brings me to the final topic of our feature. What if you don't have someone? What if you're all alone? How does intimacy come into play then? The truth is there's no easy answer there. But the most important intimate relationship, whether you have someone else in your life or you don't, is with yourself. Start with you. Be honest with you. Take a good look inside. What lies are you telling yourself? What truths are you avoiding? Now, don't overwhelm yourself. And be careful how you approach uncovering some psychological traumas. You're going to need professional help with this. Please seek out a counselor to help you through this process. Especially if you're in Benza withdrawal and still healing. Take this one step at a time. And maybe it can wait until you find some windows. During a wave may not be the time. But use this time while you're healing when you can to better yourself. Not so much for your future partner as much as for you. My wife and I started dating at the same stage in both of our lives, after we both had the same realization. That realization was that we're okay being alone. We like ourselves, and we decided we were going to be fine. Eighteen months later, we were married, and twenty-three years later, I'm still by her side. The most attractive quality in any human being is love. Love of your family, love of your friends, and most of all, love of yourself. Maybe you might not find that right person while you are healing, but wouldn't it be great if when you came out the other side, you were ready for a relationship? Ready for that new and exciting person that you so desperately been looking for and deserve? And in the meantime, until that time comes, we're here. You're truly not alone. So thanks for listening to our feature today. I hope this was helpful. I hope it was informative and that it, it touched a chord with people and, and maybe helped you get through some of the difficult times. Let's move on to our disclaimer. Just give you about 30 seconds here, and then we'll get to our moment of peace. Thanks. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical, health, or psychological advice, nor any other kind of personal or professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benzo Free Podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. This podcast is a production of Denim Mountain Press, copyright 2018, all rights reserved. And that brings us to our closing, our moment of peace. It's just one minute, and it's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit before returning to the chaos of the real world. The way this works is that I will give you a brief introduction, perhaps a suggestion of something to focus on. Then I'll play a soft bell, which will indicate the start of one minute. This will be followed by another soft bell, which will indicate the end of one minute. And that will be the end of the episode. Feel free to continue to meditate if you choose. If not, continue on with your day. And please remember to only do this exercise if you are in a safe place where you can close your eyes and meditate safely. Today we're going to keep in line with our feature topic. We're going to do an intimate meditation. And the focus of your intimate energies can be on anyone. 
on someone you love, someone you wish felt love, or on yourself if you choose. The mantra for today simply is, may you feel loved. So let's get started. Close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly. Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly along with all the stress of your day. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And breathe out slowly, relaxing your entire body. Now just breathe slowly and naturally. And imagine the person you wish to focus on right in front of you. If it's yourself, picture yourself sitting in front of you. And repeat the mantra to them in your mind. May you feel loved. Continue to do this for one minute. Our next episode is episode 20, and it will be released next Wednesday. Thank you again for joining me today, and please, let me know how we did. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.